All right. It is Wednesday night. I do have the correct date up on the PowerPoint, unless you're watching online. Forgot that. At least I have the right uh, psalm number there, though. So tonight we're going to be looking at Psalm 85. And I'm always interested in, in looking at the what I call the header information in, in a lot of the Bible versions, they just include it as part of verse 1. Uh, some Bible translations leave it off completely, but I like to look at it. This one says, To the chief musician, a psalm for the sons of Korah. We've looked at that phrase, to the chief musician, before. It basically means to the choir director, the one who's in charge of the music for the temple. But then a psalm for the sons of Korah. Uh, that's a little more interesting. According to the internet... The Sons of Korah are an Australian Christian band founded in 1994. Band name references the Old Testament family of that name. They are famous for taking psalms and putting them to music and recording them for Christian channels. Anyway, those are not the Sons of Korah we're talking about tonight. Happy, healthy looking group there. Uh, the Sons of Korah are, um, they, First of all, who is Korah? You might remember him, and we're getting ready to see him in our Sunday night messages. Korah was one of the men, he was actually a cousin to Moses. And in the book of Numbers, we read that Korah led a rebellion against Moses. It was Korah and Dathan and Abiram. Um, in Numbers 16.1, it says, Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and it names a couple more, they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. So these were, these were leaders. And Korah, and um, I guess he was probably the main instigator, but he got them and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. So he had some so-called spiritual leaders, 250 princes of the, the tribes. And because he was a Levite, you know, he said, we're all priests. How come you're in charge? So he was not only rebelling against Moses, but also against God, because God was the one that put Moses in charge. You ask Moses if he wanted to be in charge, he would have said no. But he did it because God told him he needed to. And then, so if we follow that story through Numbers chapter 26, it did not go well for them. Uh, it's summed up in, in, as they're counting the number of males from the age of 20 and up, there's a kind of a gap there. Because it says, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up together with Korah when that company died, what time the fire devoured 250 men and they became a sign. So not good to rebel against God and against the leadership that God put in place over them. And um, it was similar to Elijah and the prophets of Baal. I mean, it was, it was quite a wipeout. God left no doubt in anyone's mind who he chose to lead the people of Israel. And then in Numbers 26, 11, it's very important to read. It says, notwithstanding, the children of Korah died not. Because that would have left a big, you know, it just wiped out that whole family line, the Korahites, as they became known. But it says there they did not die for the sin of their father, so his children survived his act of rebellion against God. And these psalms were either written by them or for them, uh, depending on what you see. And so these are the 11 psalms that are written, and they say in the header information, um, for the sons of Korah. In the King James, it says, for the sons of Korah. Some of the translations say, of the sons of Korah. Some say, by the sons of Korah. So it doesn't really matter. It's just an interesting um, array of topics. Psalm 42, uh, thirsting for God during times of trouble. Um, 
44, past deliverances and present trials. Psalm 45, the king's marriage. 46, God as a refuge for his people. Psalm 47, God as king of the earth. Psalm 48, the beauty and glory of Zion. Psalm 49, the folly of trusting in riches. Psalm 84, a longing for the temple worship. Psalm 85, a plea for God's mercy on the nation. Psalm 87, the privileges of citizenship in Zion. And Psalm 88, a prayer for salvation from death. So these these psalms are, are really beautiful psalms. And they're worth studying. Tonight we're covering Psalm 85. So if you have your Bible tonight, I encourage you to follow along. If not, I'll have the verses up here. And I'd like to, again, this week, read them responsibly. I'll take the first chunk of each verse, and if you could read together the the second half. There's one verse that has three parts. I'll take the first, you take the second, and we'll read together the third. Okay? All right, we'll get that up there. Psalm 85.1. Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Very good. Now that phrase, thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob, when you first glance at it, the King James makes is a little unclear. It's not that you're bringing them back into captivity, you're bringing them out of captivity. You're bringing, returning them to the land from the place where they were held captive. So actually freeing them from captivity is what that phrase means. Um, their chains of captivity have been broken, and the implication in the psalm is that God's anger was appeased and that he was ready to once again bless his people. So their time of captivity is over. And there's a great spiritual picture here as well. Now, not everything that you read that's addressed to Israel applies to Christians, but a lot of it does. And there's some really beautiful passages here if we put that spiritual look at them. And this is one of them. Um, When we repent of our sins, God returns us to fellowship with him. We're removed from the captivity of sin in our life. When we repent and turn back to God, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So they've gotten right with the Lord and they're being returned from their captivity. And speaking of forgiveness, verse 2, Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Looking at this verse on its own, I just I was struck by the fact that this could have been taken right out of the New Testament with talking about the forgiveness of sins and having our, our sins covered by the blood of the Lord. Um, the phrase has forgiven is literally interpreted as taken away. Our sins are removed from us. And God took away our sins and placed them on the Lord Jesus as he hung on the cross. And our sin is covered by the blood of the Lord. The sin is hidden. God says it's removed as far as the east from the west. It's gone through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. God sees it no more. It is covered. Verse 3. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thy anger. And I see the, the wrath and anger of God have been removed. The nation of Israel was suffering from the wrath of God due to their sin. I mean, we read that as we go through the the books of the kings and chronicles, they just, they sinned and they sinned and they sinned. And occasionally you get a little revival and then eventually they were taken into captivity and God had had enough of them, but he wasn't done with them. And we see that here um, with their sins forgiven and covered in the blood, God's wrath is removed. He, he turns from the fierceness of his wrath. And spiritually speaking, when we receive the gift of salvation by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God turns his wrath from us. That wrath was placed upon the Lord Jesus. 
on the cross. Our sins were placed on him. Um, that punishment was, was taken. Our punishment that we deserve was taken and placed on the Lord Jesus. So this, ver this verse about having God removing his wrath from the nation of Israel I very easily applies to those who put their faith in him. But it's also very scary to think about the wrath of God. You know, you've heard the famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. You don't want to be there, right? Um, how many have heard, that, heard of that sermon? Yeah, I figured some of you back there. Anyway, it is a, a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. And here in this psalm, all that wrath, all that anger from all that sin, and God takes it away. Verse 4. Turn us, O God of our salvation. And cause thy anger toward us to cease. So that phrase, turn us, it's a, it's a call for repentance. Our repentance is turning and, and going the other way. When we're headed towards sin and we turn and walk the other way, that's called repentance. Um, the psalmist is asking God to turn our hearts to repentance so that he can turn his anger away from us. Um, it's similar to David's cry in Psalm 51. In, in verse 10 in Psalm 51, it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Talking about renewing our heart in fellowship with him. Uh, verse 12, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. We're talking again, renewing, restoring things. That's what God is about. He um, doesn't want to be angry at us. He doesn't want us to pay for our own sins. That's why, he, that's why he sent the Lord Jesus to earth to die on the cross for us. And so through faith, we can restore, be restored unto that joy of our salvation. Verse 5. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou? As I said, God's anger and wrath isn't meant for us. God's love is meant for us. When we choose sin, we choose God's wrath, but that is not God's desire. 1 Thessalonians 5.9 says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's God's plan for us, is to receive the gift of salvation. It's already paid for. We need to receive it. Those who don't receive it will see his wrath. God's, the psalmist is asking the question. It's notice it's two questions. He asks, when will your anger be satisfied? There's a basic summary of it. The answer is when we turn in repentance and place our faith and trust in him, then his anger is satisfied. He's, he is removed from us. Verse 6, great verse. Wilt thou not revive us again? It's an interesting phrase that, or that word revive. In order to be revived, something has to have been alive before. Because you can't bring something back from the dead that has never been alive. So this implies that this is something that was there and then was gone, and then God brought it back. It's revived, brought back to life. And we were spiritually alive, but the fire has gone out of our soul. We haven't lost our salvation. When you're saved, you're saved forever. But sometimes the cares of this world, the problems we face, the temptations we face, they rob us of our joy, the joy of our salvation. And... We lose our desire for God. And we need spiritual revival. We need brought back to life spiritually through faith and hope in God. We need spiritual revival. We have, I mean, those who are saved, their spirit is sealed unto the day of redemption. You know, we're, we're, our salvation is permanent, but occasionally we get distracted, don't we? You know, we have... We have brothers and sisters 
you know, who get under our skin. They try to rob us of our joy, our neighbors or coworkers. Well, I gotta be careful, coworkers in a family run business. <laughs> but we need to make sure that we don't lose the joy of our salvation. We need to keep focused on the Lord and, and through faith in him, keep looking to the Lord and, and, and be revived again, get into the word. And it talks about that as we go on along here. How to get out of that is by listening to the word of God. Verse 7. Show us thy mercy, O Lord. And grant us thy salvation. So this verse is tied into the previous verse. As we seek and pray for revival, we beg God for mercy, and he restores to us the joy of our salvation. You know, we, we get in, into uh, the, the pit of despair, the depths of despair, um, because life is just so hard, right? We beg the Lord for his mercy, and he, he delivers us. As sheep, we go wandering off and getting into trouble. Some of you are, have sheep now, right? And sometimes they go where they're not supposed to. Is that right? Often. Often. <laughs> as the good shepherd, well, we do too as the sheep. Uh, as the good shepherd, Christ goes out of his way to bring us back into the safety of the fold. It's like you guys have to do with your little sheep. Verse 8. This is the three-parter. I will hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. The Lord speaks to us through his word. Um, here it talks about hearing the Lord speak. And the Lord speaks to us through his word. We need to listen. The psalmist states that Listening to the word of the Lord will keep us from returning to the foolishness of sin. You know, you can only, I mean, you bring the sheep back as many times as necessary, right? But by focusing on the word, listening to the word, memorizing the word, that should help us to go astray a little less often, right? Psalm 119.11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The more we're in the word, the more we're digesting it, it should help us to stop making as many dumb mistakes. God's word will keep us from sin, and sin will keep us from his word. So we need to be on the Psalm 119.11 side of that equation, hiding God's word in our heart that we might not sin against him. Verse 9. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him. That glory may dwell in thy hands. The psalmist here is speaking specifically of the nation of Israel, but this verse is universal in its scope. The glory of God is his presence. He talks about his salvation is near them that fear him, but his glory dwelling in the land is his presence. Um, his presence is with those who fear him, and he grants them salvation. James states, draw nigh to God, and he will draw, draw nigh to you. You know, as we turn and repent and go towards God, we, we see him like the father in the story of the prodigal. He runs to meet us, who welcomes us back. In spite of what we've done, God receives us back when we seek him. If you seek the Lord, you will find him. Verse 10. We're flying through these. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Do you like that picture? <laughs> these things go together like pancakes and syrup. They just belong together. Um, they rely on each other. Uh, verse 10 shows how these things are attached. Mercy requires truth. Truth 
is the acknowledgement of sin. You know, mercy is the forgiving of those sins. But without the confession, truth, there is no forgiveness, mercy. It's offered, but you have to acknowledge your sin to receive it. And that's how those two are tied together. And the second half of the verse shows that not only do righteousness and peace go hand in hand, they actually kiss each other. How's that for a picture? Aren't you glad I didn't get a picture of that on there? Righteousness and peace. Um, a righteous life, living the way God intended us to, gives us a peaceful heart. You know, when you're, it's when you're fighting God. If you're a believer and you're fighting God and you're living in sin, you will not have peace in your heart. So peace and righteousness are kissing. They belong together like pancakes and syrup. Verse 11. Truth and righteousness. What was that for? <laughs> Never mind. All right. Truth and truth. I'll, we'll start again. Truth shall spring out of the earth. And righteousness shall come down from heaven. So this is a gardening verse. You know, we have, just like in the previous verse, these two are tied together. Truth is the plant. It's springing out of the earth. And righteousness is the sun shining down and making it grow. Truth thrives in an environment of righteousness. When you're living the way God intends you to live, you don't have to be afraid of the truth. You know, we see a lot of anger at the truth these days in the news and people going ballistic when they are confronted with the truth. Um, we see that truth thrives in this righteousness, this, this environment of, of righteousness. And the, on the opposite side of the spectrum, we know that evil thrives in darkness. You know, the Bible says that in John 3, 19, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You know, they, they hate truth, they hate righteousness, the the evil of the world does not like to have the truth of God's word shed on it. So, kind of an ugly picture. So we'll focus on the, the truth and the light, the righteousness shining down on it. In verse 12, we have God's blessings. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good. So this is another agricultural verse, a picture. The Lord provides rain and shine, and the land brings forth blessings. But with the spiritual connotation, the Lord provides spiritual nutrients so that we can grow in him. And the picture of this is the Lord is providing everything for the plants to grow. and He provides everything that we need to grow spiritually. It's there. We just need to take advantage of it. Second uh, Peter 3.18 says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. We're expected to grow. If we're not growing, we're backsliding. And we grow through spending time in his word, through spending time in prayer, through spending time with other believers. They can't be... Uh, underestimated how important that is that we spend time together with other believers. God will provide everything we need, but again, it's, it's our job to receive it so that we can grow in grace and knowledge of him. And Psalm 85, 13, the, the righteous way. Righteousness shall go before him. Living righteously puts us on his path. You know, this shows the footsteps. How many of you know that old 1980s poem, Footprints in the Sand? You guys are too young, you missed it. You can find it online. It used to be almost every home had a poster 
of this little poem that said, had, was Footprints in the Sand. And she, let's see if I can summarize it correctly. It's been like 40 years since I've seen it. The guy is walking on the beach with the Lord. And he looks back on his life and he sees two sets of footprints with the Lord walking beside him. And at one point in the hardest, dif most difficult parts of his life, there's only one set of footprints. And he says, Lord, why was it that when I was in these difficulties, I only see one set of footprints? He said, it, because it was then that I carried you. Yeah. Isn't that touching? Anyway, I think that's what this footprints picture was intended for, but I cropped it. Living righteously puts us on his path. The Bible says, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. He wants us to live righteously so that his name isn't dragged through the mud by believers who aren't living for him. So he will lead us on the righteous path if we'll let him. He wants us to follow him so that he is glorified by our works. So this is a great psalm for when you're feeling lost and confused, when you're feeling concerned about our country, which I am. We need revival. And it's a great verse. Lord, wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee. I think it's one, one a really good psalm for that. When you're feeling lost, confused, concerned, this psalm is a, a call for God's mercy, both on the nation of Israel and in the life of the individual. So we can pray through this psalm ourselves and trust these promises. So that's actually all I have. Um, let's close with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your, this psalm. We thank you for the, the blessings that you provide. We pray that you would keep our hearts in tune with you, and that we would walk in righteousness, and we would spend time in your word and in prayer and in the company of each other. You'd help us to build each other up in the faith and be a blessing to each other. We ask your blessings upon our church. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Don't bother the Iwana folks.